Kevin. Um, yeah, so this is going to be kind of a lecture with a different uh, flavor than the ones that we've seen before. Eh? In particular, it will be um, much more focused on understanding uh, the theoretical foundations of um, some of the reinforcement learning algorithms and protocols that you've seen in class. Now, if we take um, a big step back and try to um, take a look at all the algorithms that you've seen in class and think about potential applications to the real world, you will see that there are still some challenges. Um, one challenge is, for example, designing um, stable reinforcement learning algorithm. In particular, um, this might uh, require some designing um, of um, uh, certain tricks uh, to ensure stability of the reinforcement learning algorithms. And often it translates into uh, tuning some hyperparameters to achieve a certain performance. Now, another key issue um, about applying reinforcement learning paradigms to the real world is data efficiency. In general, reinforcement learning algorithms are extremely data hungry, and they do require much more data than, uh, uh, for example, algorithms that we commonly use in supervised learning. Then there is the issue about generalization. Often, um, a specific algorithm is tuned and, and, um, and it learns on a specific task. But it is much more difficult to design general class, um, general purpose algorithms that can perform well across completely different tasks. Um, and another issue is uh, computational efficiency. If you try to do some of the homeworks in, in the class, uh, you will see that uh, sometimes it takes uh, quite a long time to train. Now, all these issues um, are kind of specific to reinforcement learning, but they are issues that sort of prevent um, reinforcement learning from being applied uh, more broadly um, in real-world problems, where issues like stability, convergence, uh, and, and sample efficiency becomes really uh, fundamental. In, in particular, if you're interacting in the real world, uh, somehow you would like some predictability for what the algorithm is going to do. And also, samples are generally quite expensive because they amount to interaction uh, with the real world. And so in this talk, uh, we will try to take sort of a step back and try to understand some of the foundations for uh, um, the reinforcement learning algorithms. And why do we want to develop sort of a theory for, for reinforcement learning? Well, perhaps the most basic motivation is that really the key basic protocols that people use in the reinforcement learning are really algorithms that are motivated by theory. For example, value iteration, uh, policy iteration, um, upper confidence bound exploration, reinforced policy gradients. Those algorithms are all algorithms that at least uh, they, are, they are somewhat inspired by theory. And oftentimes they come uh, with guarantees, uh, at least in their simplest form. There are also some success stories <clears throat> of translating algorithms that were developed from theory into uh, something more practical. One example is randomized least square value iteration, which you might know as a, a bootstrap DQN. Moreover, theory can give you some consideration that apply not just to a specific problem, the one that you're trying to solve, but maybe more broadly uh, to a, a, wide, a wide class of problems, and I would say more broadly to the field of RM. And also, they help uncover uh, fundamental limits. Uh, for example, things that you cannot do. And you, we will see an example of that um, today. Now, what question would we like to ask um, from a theoretical point of view? Well, ideally, um, we would like to have some form of guarantees for an algorithm that we are studying. For example, if you are proposing a new algorithm, you would like to understand whether it converges. And that's kind of the primary concern that you might have uh, uh, when you go ahead and you want to apply it to a real problem. You would like to understand how to choose uh, the hyperparameters, whether there is any sort of ways or formula or, or trade-off uh, that you need to make. Another question is how much data um, does the algorithm need to collect in order to achieve a certain uh, level of performance? 
So how many interactions? And also you might be concerned with things like computational complexity and so running time of the algorithm. This is what you would like to study, but in reality, um, answering those questions is extremely challenging. It's extremely difficult. Um, for example, for most of the uh, deep RL algorithms, it's not even possible to prove convergence because at the end of the day, the basic temporal difference scheme uh, or TD with experience replay and, and, and target networks, they are not always guaranteed to converge. And so immediately we have sort of a challenge. Um, and it turns out that answering those questions is generally extremely difficult. And so what you will see today is that there is kind of a huge gap right now between uh, the practical algorithms that you've seen in the class and some of the consideration that uh, we will go through today. But at any rate, uh, I will focus mostly on understanding um, the statistical aspects of RL, and so how many samples do you need to learn uh, a certain problems. And I will look into sort of three different macro topics. Um, one is about trying to understand what reinforcement learning problems are easy and hard, um, and whether we can learn faster or easier problems. And then I will focus on uh, um, understanding the interplay between RL algorithms and function approximation, so the issue of generalization. I will talk briefly about um, statistical limits, what you cannot do with reinforcement learning algorithms, and also uh, briefly about uh, offline reinforcement learning. Now, let's get to sort of the first part, uh, understanding what problems are easy and what problems are hard. The setting that we consider here is uh, the exploration problem. I think most of the class that, uh, uh, that you've gone through is about uh, um, exploration algorithms. Think about the standard online setting, DQN, all these. And so in this setting, you have a reinforcement learning agent that is starting with an empty data set. And there is an interaction for H steps until the end, for example, of a game. And this interaction is ongoing and it continues for a number of episodes. And you would like to measure how quickly a reinforcement learning agent is learning. Now, intuitively, <clears throat> the reinforcement learning agent starts with a policy that might be suboptimal. If it is playing Atari, the first policy is going to be bad if you start with an empty data set. But then progressively, it is going to learn and play policies that are better and better. What we would like to do is um, to measure the performance of the algorithm. And uh, the standard way to do it, let me try to move this thing. On. The standard way to do it is to um, define a quantity that, that is called regret, which you might have seen in class. And it's really um, the sum of the suboptimality gaps of the policy played by the agent. At, intuitively, at least if the problem is easy, um, an algorithm that is learning will approach, in terms of performance, the value of the optimal policy. But it will start at the, in a way that it doesn't know much. And so the initial value of the policy that it plays are going to be low. And if we sum all the suboptimality gaps as a function of the episode, uh, well, that would amount to computing the integral of this curve, so the, the area shaded in orange. Um, and that's what we call uh, regret of the algorithm. Our goal will be to try to design an algorithm uh, that minimizes the regret. Now, in most cases, you can do that. For example, in DeepRL, it's, it's not, not so clear that uh, you can do that. And so we will focus on problems that are uh, for the first part of today, with small state and action spaces. It's a problem where we have a tabular representation. And if we go back to maybe 2010, 2011, and subsequent years, um, in the foundations of RL, there was a huge push to try to design algorithms that could be as efficient as possible on tabular problems. In particular, and um, several algorithms have been proposed, and these they had some form of regret bound that there was a function of the state and action space. 
in particular its cardinality, the horizon, and, uh, um, and the number of episodes. Um, those regret bounds are useful because they apply um, broadly to any problem that is a Markov decision process. You don't need to worry about the specific of the problem as long as you have you know, finite state in action space, you have a guarantee on uh, uh, these algorithms. And this is also their limitation in the sense that uh, it is not clear whether a certain algorithm would perform better or worse if the problem had a certain structure. And this is what we see in practice, that the performance of reinforcement learning algorithms varies greatly, even for the same algorithm, on problems that are uh, quite different. And so we would like to start and try to derive some systematic understanding of what problems are difficult and what problems are easy um, to explore in reinforcement learning. Now, um, from an historical point of view, there has been um, a lot of effort into improving those regret bounds until essentially we got uh, one algorithm that in, in terms of worst case performance, it was unimprovable, meaning that it had a performance guarantee across all problems that was as good as possible given the lower bound that we need, meaning that the performance is not improvable um, without any limit. There is a fundamental limit that you cannot surpass. At the same time, we know, we know that there are classes of problems that are very different from um, the type of contrived construction that creates the lower bound. One example is a problem that has no dynamics or weak memory. A problem that has weak memory is a problem where the action that you took in the past, they have really little impact on your state. Think about uh, um, a recommender system, which is a type of contextual bandit problem, well, that is a situation in which um, this weak memory uh, sort of arises. In a recommender system, think about a customer coming to Amazon. Um, if you make a bad recommendation, intuitively, you might make a certain customer um, unhappy, but this won't affect uh, the next customer that you see. And so that's a problem of uh, weak memory. And for bandit problems, we do know that there are specific bandit algorithms that take advantage of the structure, and they are able to learn much faster than uh, uh, classical Markov decision processes. <clears throat> Likewise, problems that are deterministic are generally much easier. It's, it's, all, it's essentially a search problem. Likewise, problems where you can only move locally in the state and action space are generally problem that are easier, because if you make a mistake, you can still recover somehow. One example is mountain car. Now, the question that we ask is, if we treat these problems as um, tabular problems, where we have an explicit representation of the state and action space and the dynamics, what do the e these easy problems have in common? Can we identify some common characteristics and try to measure how hard they are? And can we learn faster if the problem belongs, uh, um, if the actual problem instance that we face belongs to some of these subclasses. Well, we gave a positive answer to this, uh, and we proposed uh, first a problem dependent complexity, and then an algorithm based on that uh, that had certain specific properties. First of all, we propose some uh, problem dependent complexity measure that characterizes the complexity of. Um, different reinforcement learning problems. In particular, it is defined uh, um, by the interaction of the system dynamics and the value of the optimal policy. It is defined as the variance of the next state uh, optimal value function. And uh, this is not something that um, the algorithm can compute if you do not know the actual Markov decision process because the optimal value function is unknown and the dynamics are also unknown. But nonetheless, you can design an algorithm that has a performance bound that scale with this quantity 
uh, which is generally unknown. And the algorithm doesn't need to know that. As a result, the algorithm is able to match uh, the best performance for uh, tabular mapping decision processes, meaning that it is minimax optimal, it isn't improvable, but compared to the state of the art, it can also attain the optimal performance um, if the problem belongs to a certain class of easier problems. For example, if it is a contextual bandit problem, then the algorithm automatically matches uh, uh, essentially the performance of basic UCB on contextual bandits. And in addition to being um, uh, analytically small on certain problem sub subclasses, you can evaluate the quantity numerically. And it's going to appear here is on, on problems that people have considered before, eh? it takes a value that is much smaller than sort of a worst case value that was suggested by uh, prior bounds. So essentially, it is a quantity that um, it is both analytically small on problems that we care about, but also numerically small um, on problems that have been considered before. Now, I want to pause one second and ask if there is any technical question on this part before I move ahead. Um, the intuition, well, it really depends on um, the type of problem. So, for example, if a problem has weak memory, it's a contextual bandit problem, what happens is that a mistake that you might make in a certain state, it doesn't really have long-term consequences. And so the next state value function um, it wouldn't be too much different across different states. And so essentially this quantity has to be small. You might make an error, but you only lose with the current customer, right? You don't mess up the entire long-term plan, right? Um, and so this quantity end up being smaller. Think about as being um, some challenge in estimating the um, the effect of transitions, but the transitions can be highly stochastic. For example, in, again, in bandits, they are highly stochastic, um, but still there is not much variability in the value of the state that you end up with. In that case, it's going to be small. The supremum, you can, you can relax it you know, as expectation over uh, trajectory. It is supremum in the actual work, but you can relax. Okay. Um, I want to give one slide that is perhaps a bit more technical um, about how do we go about achieving something like this. Um, well, exploration generally is typically achieved at least for probably efficient algorithms, by adding an exploration bonus to the experience reward. Think about DQN. The exploration there is done with epsilon greedy, at least in the most basic form. Um, but if you want more sophisticated schemes, uh, um, think about UCB in, in bandit algorithms. Normally what's done is a bonus is added. Now, the bonus can take uh, different forms. Uh, the most basic one that prior art was using is something that scales uh, um, with the inverse of the number of samples. It comes from often inequality. Uh, but this type of um, exploration bonus is essentially problem independent, meaning that it's, it's not tied to any particular feature of the MDP. And so the algorithm would explore in the same way, regardless of the problem. And this won't give rise to problem-dependent bounds. Now, the ideal choice that one would like to make is to use uh, some form of Bernstein-based concentration inequality, which does indeed contain uh, um, something very similar to the quantity that we want. Um, it would give rise to problem-dependent bounds, but there is one issue, that in general, the optimal action value function 
you don't know what it is. And the transition dynamics, you also don't know what it is. So although this choice of the bonus would be ideal, um, it would not practically give rise, like it's not something that you can do uh, in practice. And the way around it is sort of intuitive, is to try to use the empirical dynamics and some empirical estimate of the optimal value function. But there are several challenges that arise if you try to do that. The main challenge is that generally those quantities, they are unknown. Think about when you start initially, you know very, very little about uh, the dynamics. And so you have essentially no way to guess what these quantities are. And if you take uh, the, wrong, the wrong guess, um, essentially the algorithm might not be optimistic enough. It might not explore enough. Um, and, uh, and it would just um, not find a good policy. So what you have to do is rather to introduce some correction terms. Thankfully, those correction terms that try to correct for your wrong estimates um, they decay very quickly. So they decay at a faster rate. And so it is, it is as if the agent was applying a, sort of the correct Bernstein-based concentration inequality, but with one correction term that is decaying very quickly. And the challenge here lies in uh, um, estimating the, the size of the correction, in particular because we have to correct some value function that is uh, different from uh, the optimal one. And estimating those errors, uh, it requires estimating how error propagates uh, through the MDP um, from states that perhaps we haven't even visited that much. And this choice essentially uh, gives rise to uh, those problem dependent bounds. Now, <clears throat> This is good because it, it, it does give you some uh, <clears throat> initial sort of strong understanding of uh, whether it's possible to adapt uh, to the problem difficulty and whether it's possible to be at the same time minimax optimal, but also instance optimal on a variety of problem classes that we are interested in. But the big limitation here is that, uh, of course, this thing applies only to small state and action spaces. Um, in practice, we would like to tackle problems that have a very large, potentially continuous um, state and action space. And to be clear, what you've seen in the class is always in this second category. As soon as you start using any form of function approximation, uh, you are in, in this category. And so the next question that we will try to understand is what can we say about reinforcement learning with function approximation. And the answer will turn out to be a bit more negative than, than here. Here we made some sort of um, positive progress. But here we will see that uh, when you start to talk about reinforcement learning with function approximation, even problems that seem to be easy, uh, they might be very challenging. And so to do a quick recap, uh, Practical problems, they always have a state space that uh, is extremely large. Most states are never visited. What we would like to do is to introduce some form of function approximation um, that can add generalized knowledge from the states that we have seen to states uh, that we have not yet, yet observed. And the hope uh, is that we do not need to learn what to do in every state. Rather, we need only a number of samples that is roughly of the same order um, as the number of parameters in our model. Now, the observation that, um, the folklore observation, if you want, uh, that we have is that reinforcement learning algorithm, they use function approximation. They still need a lot of samples compared to um, supervised learning. And so we would like to ask a very basic question, whether reinforcement learning is, for example, fundamentally more difficult um, than classical supervised learning. And in order to study this question, we consider a setting that is uh, very similar to the 
of line of enforcement learning setting that you have seen in, in the second part of the class. Um, in the offline of enforcement learning setting, you have um, some data set that is available and it consists of state, actions, reward, and, and success states. And we try to ask questions about, uh, for example, policies that might be different from um, uh, the one that generated the data set. You may, for example, want to try to identify the optimal policy, or you may try to do off policy evaluation. Um, the specific setting that we consider is one in which we allow some sort of data collection with a static distribution before. Um, and the reason to do that, uh, to allow for some flexibility, is because if the data set is poor, intuitively we cannot do much. And that's not the algorithm fault, it's just the data set. Maybe I have just data on a single state. So we do consider a case in which you can do some form of data collection with a static policy beforehand. And then we try to understand uh, uh, whether we can successfully predict uh, um, the value of a different policy, for example, or extract uh, the value of the optimal policy. <clears throat> now, our expectation is that if the action value function has a simple representation, for example, if the action value function um, has a linear expansion and uh, perhaps we even know the feature extractor, then this should be an easy problem. Why? Well, it's just by analogy with linear regression. If you are solving a regression problem and um, I give you um, a feature map and, and I promise that the problem is realizable, so the target uh, do have some linear expansion perhaps with some noise, then you can open a textbook in, in statistics and you will see that um, standard linear regression can learn this problem very quickly. However, in reinforcement learning, even problems that are linear, they don't seem to be so easy. In particular, there have been um, examples of divergence of classical TD and, and fitted Q, even on problems that are linearly realizable. And in fact, if you take a look at the analysis that, that are available for uh, some of the basic algorithms and protocols, you will see that they all make some assumptions that seem to be um, much more stronger than just realizability. And so as a matter of fact, uh, we don't know in 2020, 2021, whether even the simplest linear setting is something that we can provide stable algorithms for. Can we provide an algorithm um, that, for example, converges? And converges, yes, because you can use LSTD. But can we have any guarantee about, uh, um, for example, the amount of samples that are required to learn even in this simple setting, which is the first step after tabular problems? And really to understand what's happening, um, you need to compare supervised learning with uh, reinforcement learning. And the key difference is whether you're trying to make predictions for one time step or for many time step. <clears throat> this is because if you're trying to make predictions for one time step and you start with a data set that you might have recollected in an intelligent way, um, well, if you're trying to just predict the first reward and you have the promise that the reward function is linear, then we know that linear regression um, solves this problem very, very quickly. So we know an algorithm and we know guarantees as well. And this is the most basic uh, machine learning algorithm that you can think of. However, the, our question is what happens if we want to predict the value of a policy for multiple time steps with the problem, with the, with the guarantee that that value is actually realizable, meaning that we have a feature extractor um, that correctly predicts the value of the target policy for some theta parameter. It turns out that this problem is, uh, in the worst case, extremely difficult, meaning that um, as opposed to supervised learning, you can find problems where you have this beautiful linear model, and yet um, any algorithm would take a number of samples to make the correct predictions that is exponential 
in uh, uh, the dimensionality of the feature extractor. And when I say predictions, um, you can intend this broadly, meaning that uh, the, the answer would remain the same eh? if you were trying to, for example, identify an optimal policy. I want a policy that does better than random. You still need um, a number of samples that, in the worst case, might be exponential in the dimensionality of the feature extractor. And so we see that there is a strong separation between uh, what is achievable in uh, supervised learning, which is concerned with making predictions. And so if you want a one-step prediction, um, and the reinforcement learning, which considers sequential processes. As, as the horizon becomes longer, uh, the problems can become exponentially harder. This doesn't mean that all problems are exponentially harder, but it does tell you that even problems that appear to be simple, the problems that should be linear, uh, and, and so they should be easily learnable, you will not be able to find uh, an algorithm that has uh, guarantees even on those problems. And so for you, in order to learn, or for for an algorithm to learn, there has to be some uh, um, additional special structure. And indeed, this is something that we sort of see, uh, that indeed poor sample complexity is a major issue in RL, um, and this issue is also related to um, divergence. But the contribution here is really to identify that those issues are algorithm independent. They're information theoretic, meaning that uh, there is some fundamental hardness in the reinforcement learning problem that applies broadly to all algorithms that you can come up with. You will not be able to find an algorithm that is able to solve all problems, even if they are as simple as linear. And this issue has been studied more broadly uh, uh, by some other sort of important papers, and, and some have sort of similar result. And um, if you want to sort of reinterpret this second section, um, you could also take a look at that from the point of view of online RL. I might have an action value function, think about what you have in DQN, and instead of having a deep neural network, you just have a simple linear map. And I promise to you that the problem really does have a linear action value function. Still, uh, it will not be able, you, you will not be able to find an algorithm that can learn uh, um, polynomially fast uh, um, in, in a problem that is linear. And so the main takeaway here is that linear regression is easy in start, but the equivalent in the reinforcement learning from a model three point of view um, is already out of reach. And so we have to be sort of um, not, too op not too optimistic about uh, uh, the type of problems that we can solve. And there has been indeed a big effort trying to understand what additional conditions are necessary um, in order to have um, polynomial sample complexity as we have uh, for many statistical um, algorithms in statistics. Now, before we move forward, is there any question on, on, on sort of this second section? Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing that is really tricky is that this is really a model three um, point of view, right? So we're looking at whether we have enough information on the Q values, um, but somehow you can have problems that are extremely complex, but the action value function ends up being simple. It's an, it ends up being sort of linear. So the actual counterexample has essentially a reward function that is very complex. It's like a ReLU neural networks that is non-zero only in a, in a very you know, hidden area of the state space, which is exponentially larger. The dynamics are very complex. And the dynamics are sort of engineered in a way that they linearize the reward function in the sense that once you do many steps of the Bellman backup, 
you end up with an action value function that looks linear. And so it looks like the problem is easy because that thing is really linear. But what you're really trying to do is to identify where the reward function is non zero in a sort of an exponentially larger sphere. Um, I don't know if I can say much more than this, but um, it's really related to the high dimensionality um, that you have, that there's a lot of space in, in high dimension. If you take random vectors in high dimension, that will almost always be orthogonal. And so you can sort of hide information uh, in very high dimension. It's not something that is obvious in two or 3D, you really have to go uh, high dimension. Yeah, the policy pi is fixed then. Um, it could be, you know, think about predict the value of the optimal policy. It could be fixed or it could be, you know, the optimal one. Um, I do want to spend one slide talking about um, indeed what happens with more general function approximation um, in terms of positive result. Well, if you open some book about statistics, high dimensional statistics, at least for regression, you will see that there are performance guarantees um, that are a function of the very function class you're using. So if you're using kernel methods, convex functions, or other things, um, you will have some performance bound, some trade-off between approximation error and um, statistical complexity. And the statistical complexity is normally expressed in sort of more uh, in, in notions like about the market complexity, BC dimensions and, and other things. Uh, but the same is not sufficient in RF. So it looks like uh, the interplay between Bellman operator and uh, the function, the very same function class that you use to model the action value function for TD methods, but the interplay is really um, kind of important. And so what people have focused on, on to understand some foundations of RL, is not just about the complexity of the function class. This is not sufficient. Like we saw before, we have a linear map and that is already too hard. Well, there has to be something that makes the problem sort of learnable. And that's really the interaction between Bellman operator and the action value function. The reason why that's essential for TD method is that you're taking an action value function, you created the Bellman backup out of it and you're fitting sort of the same and you want that to be zero. Um, and so the interaction becomes critical. And so many, many notions have been proposed to try to understand uh, uh, in what cases can you do this uh, sort of learning in a way that is stab stable and, and uh, uh, statistically efficient. But I won't, I won't go into that. Instead, I'm gonna jump to um, some offline reinforcement learning. Um, offline reinforcement learning, you've seen it already in the class, but just to do a quick recap, it's, we, there's already a lot of data out there, so we would like to uh, leverage them. How can we do so without collecting further data? And um, the setting is the same as that, that, that you've seen in class. We have an historical data set of state actions with reward and successor states. And the task is, how do we find the policy with the highest value? What does it even mean to find the policy uh, with the highest value given a data set? Well, the highest value, of course, is, is, is the policy that, has, that is the optimal policy, but your data set may contain no information about the optimal policy. And so it's like we, we, we have to make sort of a best effort um, uh, uh, some best effort in trying to identify a good policy and lower our expectation um, and uh, perhaps not find the optimal policy. The main challenge, I think you have discussed this in class as well, is that of distribution shift, meaning that um, the data set, well, a best case scenario, which never happened, is one in which your data set has uniform samples all over the state and action space, in which case you could just try to evaluate policy by one, by two, and by three, and pick up the best. But normally what you've given is uh, um, trajectories that they might be, for example, from humans. And so they're generally narrowly concentrated. 
and uh, that's what we call problem of partial confidence. And in the example here, the data set may have a lot of information about pi one, no information about pi two, and some information about pi three. And somehow you have to come up with and, and, and choose between the three and, and figure out which policy is the best. And the thing that they want to sort of highlight today is how do we even measure this um, coverage, how much information the data set contains to find uh, um, a good policy. And intuitively, um, the way to solve this problem is precisely what we've seen in class. Um, or actually, there are two ways if you want. One is to try to stay close to uh, the policies that generated the, the, the data set, some form of um, behavioral cloning. Another way is to attempt to estimate uh, the uncertainty about your predictions. So generally, your data set has, uh, um, is generated by policies, certain policies that are sort of narrowly concentrated and and they give you data about state actions, reward, and transitions. And you would try to sort of fit some form of model and try to use the model to make predictions about the value of other policies. Now, the model doesn't actually need to be a model. You may do this in a model-free way, but you're still using some data that has been generated by some policies and make predictions about other policies. Now, of course, what you would like to do is to pick up the policy that has the highest value, but, but that's not known. Um, instead, you would like to return a policy that looks like it has good value, but that you're also reasonably confident about. And so one way to look at offline RL is um, as a procedure that tries to find some optimal trade-off between value of the policy that, that is returned and the uncertainty about this policy. Think about some bias, bias variance trade off um, in statistics. You would like to um, have an algorithm that has sort of an optimal bias variance trade off. Um, the bias is generally unknown. The variance you can try to estimate. In offline RL, there is sort of a similar uh, notion, if you want. You would like to balance the value of um, um, the policy that you return, which is unknown to you, with uh, its uncertainty. And so guarantees for offline reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, they generally look something like this. You, one algorithm should return uh, with very high probability. The best trade-off between uh, um, the value of the policy that you return and its uncertainty, which essentially amounts to finding uh, uh, the point with the highest lower bound. In a sense, offline reinforcement learning, the one that you've also seen in the class, in some way they try to uh, get to this optimal trade-off. Now, one big question is what is this sort of constant C that depends on the policy? Well, if you have seen um, concentration inequalities in statistics, you might be already familiar with the term one divided by square root of n. Is what arises from, uh, uh, for example, opting inequality. But here there is an extra uh, coefficient that depends on the policy, which should encapsulate uh, uh, the distribution shift. Now, this coefficient depends on the actual algorithm, and it depends, for example, on um, uh, the function classes that you're using and the interaction within, uh, sorry, with the Batman operator. And as a concrete instantiation, you can take, for example, softmax policies. Think about those that arise from a natural policy gradient. And um, again, for simplicity, linear action value functions, and those are two distinct parameters. And you can design algorithms that um, essentially try to solve uh, this offline reinforcement learning problem. And they will have some guarantees uh, that are precisely of this form, where these coverage coefficient um, as a certain analytical expression. And the analytical expression highlights really the interplay between the information that is contained in the data set and uh, the target policy that you're trying to uh, estimate. 
in particular, the information contained in the data set is reflected in the covariance matrix, which is a somewhat familiar object from statistics, linear regression. You compute some covariance matrix. The covariance contains the amount of information that you know about the problem. And this interact with a certain norm in its inverse with the expected feature over um, the target policy that you are considering for the optimization. Um, this quantity you know, but this one is generally not computable, right? So this sort of tells you how the two interact um, to create confidence interval for off-policy evaluation that you can use uh, to find a good policy. What is sort of surprising and, and, and perhaps not surprising, but important about this uh, is that this coverage, which is also called concentrability, um, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't have an expression in the state and action space. If you open some of the papers that do statistical analysis, you would often find a ratio between busy distribution, uh, discounted busy distribution of the target policies versus the behavioral policy. Um, and that is a ratio in the state and action space. This one has none of that. It's all projected down to a lower dimensional um, feature space where coverage can indeed be sort of much larger. Think about having a covariance matrix that is the identity uh, that would certainly make uh, um, the coverage coefficient be very small. Um, I don't think I want to talk about sort of how we, we achieve this and, and sort of the technicalities. I think the important part is how would for example, a guarantee in offline RL look like in terms of actual statement, which is what you saw in the prior slide. Um, but if you want at a very high level, um, we're trying to avoid penalizing um, actions directly, and, and we want to retain a very sort of low statistical complexity, and, and we operate in the parameter space to compute the, these confidence intervals, and, and all this is put into a big actor critic algorithms that uses um, natural policy gradient and uh, some pessimistic version of uh, um, TD with target networks where the parameters are moved in a way that uh, computes a pessimistic solution. Um, I'm going to keep the algorithm. Um, now, one limitation of this study that you've seen is that it applies to the linear setting. Of course, the, the question is what happens if I use a, a richer set of functions, for example, um, offline reinforcement learning with more general function approximations, such as the ones that you've seen in class. Can we, can we give any guarantees for those? Um, the answer is, unfortunately, there is a huge gap in the sense that the type of algorithms that you've seen in the class, it's very difficult to prove guarantees for them because they may not converge. There are variants that are sort of, in a sense, uh, that you can provide guarantees for. Right? But the big problem is that it's not clear how you would implement them. Um, and that's kind of an issue of all over L uh, with um, function, general function approximation. Um, if you want guarantees, uh, it's not clear how you would come up with an algorithm that you can actually implement. And so oftentimes what is analyzed is sort of a, a conceptual version that is not the same as uh, uh, the actual algorithm that is implemented in practice. Now, before I head to the conclusion, any question on this sort of third part? Yeah, of course. Horizon. So the small one. Um, well, the covariance, if this is a finite horizon problem, the covariance can really change through time steps. Um, it's the covariance of the features. So sum of phi, phi transpose. Feature, feature extraction. 
the same as linear regression. It's the same object appears. Yeah. Mm, what do you mean by epsilon optimal policy? This won't be this won't be optimal, right? Because it's offline RL, so it really depends on your data set. The policy that you find may be very crappy if your data set doesn't have good information. Suppose your data set is just from a policy that is narrowly concentrated and the, the, the behavioral policy is bad. And uh, this feature matrix is like rank one. It's so concentrated in one direction, then that doesn't really tell you much. And so you won't be able to find uh, uh, a good policy. But somehow this is sort of reflected in precisely that statement, right? Because policies that are very good, they would have a coverage coefficient that is very large. And so you will not know their value, and no algorithm would return that. Um, no, I think I think if you want, uh, this is the epsilon that you're talking about, right? This is the policy that we will return. Uh, um, you can always think about the optimal policy in the supremum. I want to evaluate this expression at the optimal policy. I can do that. But then this guy will become uh, uh, the value, uh, the sort of coverage about the optimal policy. And so this is your, your epsilon, right? This is epsilon suboptimal compared to the optimal policy, but epsilon can be huge. Basically, I'm telling you the value of epsilon, given the data set that we have. This C is really a way to measure how much information are contained in the data set. Um, and, and as a result, what's the performance that you can expect? Yes. Um, at the initial state, I would say. The value of the policy at the initial state. That's, that's sort of the one that you care about. And your estimates may be more off in states that, for example, you don't visit, or even in states that you visit, but they might compensate. But what you really care is performance at, at the starting point. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Right, right, right. So I think you have seen something similar with CQL, I think. Um, basically, on X, uh, let's plot, let's put different policies. To be clear, you're going to have uncountably many, right? But let's, you know, put them on, on a graph. And uh, on the Y, we're going to plot the value of the policies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Expected this can't be some of the world. Now, what you wish you knew is the actual value of, of the policies, right? The green line is the value of the policy. So if you know the actual MDP, you do value iteration, and you will find this guy, the optimal policy. Unfortunately, what you have is a data set. Now, how to use the data set is up to you. Intuitively, if you're doing model-based RL, you can try to fit some model and try to use that to make predictions. So your model may be good, it might be bad. It might generally be good to make predictions about value of policies that generated the data set. It might be very bad to predict value of different policies. You might not use a, a model-based version, and you may do something different. For example, uh, you may adopt a model-free approach, like CQL. Um, and intuitively, if you could, what you would do is the following. Try to come up with an estimator for the value of different policies, and try to measure also the uncertainty. The uncertainty is really sort of this band here, right? And, and this curve may move up and down uh, depending on, on the data set. Um, but you would like to try to estimate the uncertainty about your predictions. Intuitively, the uncertainty will be smaller for on policy evaluation, for, for the very policy that generated the data set. You have a bunch of data, you just take the average. But it will be very bad 
for a policy that is very, very different, that visits completely uh, different areas of the state and action space, right? Your data is narrowly concentrated. You have no idea about a policy that, that does something in a completely unknown area of the state and action space. So even if that policy, by doing, you know, fitted queue, it looks good, you have to take into account that you're extremely uncertain about this value, and so somehow you would like to penalize it. And so you would like to say, oh, this policy, like, is, I'm too uncertain, like, I'm, I'm going to assign it a very low value. And if I do this procedure, um, the optimal trade-off is to maximize this lower bound, the lower, a lower bound on the performance of the policies. And this gives you sort of abstractly this expression here, which will become concrete as soon as you consider a specific algorithm and uh, a specific type of you know, function class and MVP. And that will determine the, the C pi. Yeah, 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 of course, thank you. I think what's important here, like if, if you want one takeaway is really how would a guarantee of an offline algorithm look like? So it would look something like this, some trade-off between values. Of course, you want the highest value, but policy that have high value, you might be very uncertain about that. And so there's going to be some, some trade-off. Um, and just to make it, if you want, more clear, um, for the policy that are in the data set, generally you have a lot of data, right? And so this CPI is going to be something like one. You have a lot of data, so n is big, so this quantity is small. And so what this expression tells you is that you should do better than the policies that generate in the data set. If you design the algorithm correctly, this is sort of the minimum that you would expect. You want to do better than the heavy overclock, right? And, and this expression tells you exactly that. If I put pi as a behavioral policy that generated the data set, C pi will be smaller, it's gonna be one. This expression will be smaller. And this tells me I do better than uh, behavioral overclocking, which is what we would expect. Okay, um, time to sum up. Um, we have seen sort of three things. One is most problems in RL, they're not worst case, they belong to a much easier class of problems. Um, we have seen that as soon as we move to function approximation, RL is much more difficult than standard supervised learning. And then we have seen what type of guarantees we can obtain for um, um, offline uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. And to conclude, I think uh, after the presentation, this is much more clear. There is a huge gap between sort of theory and practice. Um, I think working at the intersection uh, is of course difficult, right? Because you have to sort of please both communities, but it might help make um, reinforcement learning more applicable in the sense that there are going to be compromises to be made. You won't sort of beat any benchmark. Uh, and, or, or you know, top any benchmark, but you might be able to come up with some algorithm that has some uh, um, sort of um, analysis and, uh, at least in simple cases, some stability guarantees, and, and this will be kind of critical in order to apply reinforcement learning to uh, very different problems. You would feel much more confident to apply an algorithm if it is backed by some form of guarantees that apply even in a restricted set. Um, and generally theory, you will not tell you uh, how to sort of tune hyperparameters and, and all that. So they will not necessarily, it will not necessarily inform you on the specific of any given application, but it can give you sort of more broad um, insights and foundation that apply, that apply more broadly uh, to the field. We have seen some fundamental lower bounds before um, and, um, yeah, I think with this, I conclude, and this is everything I had for today. So thank you for your attention.
I'm going to ask if there is any final question. Thank you for coming here.